Hello, this is Tyler Crone with the 36th District Democrats. We are so delighted this afternoon to be in conversation with Paul Chris Alley, who is running for King County Superior Court. Judge, we will have some questions and over to you to introduce yourself, yourself to us. Paul, thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for your time and thank you for fitting me in at, a, at the last minute like this. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm Judge Paul Chris Alley. And I'm here to ask for your endorsement for to retain my seat on uh, King County Superior Court Department number 41. I've been a lawyer in Washington for nearly 16 years and have devoted my career to public service. In addition to clerking for both the Washington State Supreme Court Justice Mary Fairhurst, as well as uh, for at the Court of Appeals, I've also worked in the Attorney General's office for 12 years. I started in the Labor and Industries Division working on complex worker safety cases inv involving oil refineries supervising superior court matters statewide and handling appeals. I then worked about six years in the complex litigation division, working on campaign finance enforcement matters, bringing challenges on behalf of the state against the proposed federal rule changes by the, the former presidential administration, defending the constitutionality of the Washington's Reproductive Parity Act and recovering fraudulently stolen CARES Act funds, to name a few. As a Superior Court judge, I'm currently based at the Kent Courthouse, where I handle every sort of case, from divorces to property disputes to complex criminal matters and simple ones as well. My approach as a judge is to study carefully the facts in the law, be fair and impartial, and demonstrate humanity when explaining my decisions in an effort to best connect with the parties before me. For this next term, I hope, intend to hone these abilities and best represent and improve a court I deeply respect and love. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our first question this afternoon will be asked by Laura Marie. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for coming in. And please, you kind of started, but if you could tell us what accomplishment are you most proud of in your legal career? As a lawyer, the accomplishments I was, I'm most proud of are where I helped improve the lives of Washingtonians and the community around me. And you could see the effects, uh, you know, from fighting for uh, individuals' reproductive rights uh, and uh, trying to get dismissed a constitutional challenge to the Reproductive Parity Act, to uh, campaign finance enforcement to try and ensure that elections are uh, free and open and that information is, in is available to the voters, uh, and simply even to just trying to ensure that workers can go to work and come home to their families at night. As a judge, it's a little bit different just because of where my touch point is with the parties, with the community, and where I get true uh, appreciation and feel the proudest is when I know I said something on the bench to an individual that connected with them. It might be in a bad situation. Uh, they're probably scared. But if I made a decision that I know is not just the right decision, but also that I'm communicating it in a way uh, that connects with that individual uh, to the point where they say thank you. Uh, I know that I've probably done a good job. I know that I've accomplished something in that day, even on a somewhat, you know, can be a somewhat mundane matter when you take it in the broader perspective of the issues facing our community. Thank you so much, Paul. The next question will be asked by Amanda. Yeah, um, racism and implicit bias may intrude into trial court proceedings. How will you identify and address racism and implicit bias in rulings and verdicts that you'll review as a judge? What is one bias you yourself used to have and how did you go about unlearning it? Uh, so I'll, I'll take it in reverse if that's all right with all of you. So I grew up in Oregon in a fairly religious household. And so statements and views towards the LGBTQI community were consistent with what you might expect from growing up in that. And, you know, as I got older, I I learned that that was wrong. And, and I learned it through uh, uh, being with other, uh, seeing it in friends, seeing it and being exposed to different points of view, different uh, people who live their lives differently, who have, um, and the like. And so it really changed my outlook. And it made me realize that I was wrong to have those kinds of biases that existed and try and correct where I could uh, areas where I felt injustices had been done in that area. For example, 
I was on the court rules uh, and procedures committee for the Washington State Bar Association before uh, marriage became legal in our state. Uh, I worked on a uh, change to the evidence rules, which don't really change that often. And I don't want to get into the, the minutia of evidence rules here, but to try and change to ensure that spousal privilege also applied to domestic partnerships. So that way they had the same rights, which seem consistent with the law, seem consistent with the purpose of what spousal immunity, uh, not immunity, spousal privilege applies to. So, uh, and then the rules changes now on the rule book still to this day. And so I'm, I'm glad that I've had the opportunity to recognize where those biases came from, learn from them, and then move from there uh, and try and fight to correct the areas where I was, uh, I had made errors. With respect to racial uh, biases in, in the courts uh, and the like, you know, it's a lot different system nowadays than where it was even when I was a lawyer. We have a rule called GR 37, which tries to ensure that we don't have implicit biases within our selection of juries. We also have our Supreme Court setting out a pretty clear statement that it's our obligation as judges to call it out, try and find it these impl implicit biases, and, and deal with them. We, uh, whenever I instruct a jury before, you know, once they come in and I'm, I put them under oath, one of my instructions is that they need to look within themselves, not just for their explicit biases, but for their implicit biases. I think it's my obligation as the person, the judge, making that statement to them, I need to do so myself and show the, them that throughout the entire trial, that's what I'm doing, as well as what I'm trying to do in real life. But where my touch point is with the community is going to be up in the, in the trial and where I'm acting as a judge. And that means I have stepped in when uh, when the lawyers didn't even, I'll, and I'll finish up in just a second, when the lawyers ha uh, haven't even noticed, if I uh, see an instance of implicit bias creeping into a jury question or creeping in somewhere, I try and step in and point it out and then figure out how to uh, address it consistent with the law and the facts. Thank you so much. Our next question is, what is something that you would like the general public to understand about this rule that they might not know? And then kind of a subset, and you can kind of pick and choose amongst this, is how much time do you spend educating the public about our courts? So it's either what you would like the general public to understand, and then that piece of educating others about what the role as our court is and, and community groups, schools, and other venues that are available to the public. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, first for the general public to understand is that we're humans. Um, we we do actually see what's going on and have emotional uh, reactions. Often they're in our own chambers behind the scenes, but we're, we're humans, we make mistakes, we deal with these things. People have the general notion that the judge is up there, knows everything and is a, sometimes they view it as a, as a robot. I think we need to address that, look, we are human. Our job is to apply the law to the facts. We take the emotion out of it, but it doesn't, uh, in making those decisions, but it doesn't mean that emotion doesn't exist. We got to recognize that. Um, I'd also like the public to know that it, we're a very supportive bench in King County Superior Court, and the judges are really supportive of one another, and, and there is a wonderful atmosphere behind there. With respect to uh, outreach to the public, I try to be engaged in whatever uh, out, uh, you know, events I can from the court, either down in Kent uh, or others. I'm a member of other organizations still to reach out to members of the public as well as members of the bar. I think it's incumbent upon judges to stay connected with the bar to understand the issues that they're facing. So way we know when they're making an argument what's going on there. Um, I'm trying to work on a, improving a program for outreach to school kids. Uh, for instance, in just a week, I'm bringing my kids' classes, they're in uh, second grade and fifth grade, to my courtroom, and sh uh, I'm bringing in another judge who doesn't look like me, comes from a different background, and show these kids, like, this is what judges can look like, this is how we got here. Um, this is a safe space, and an okay space to be, because it can be terrifying going to the courts. Um, but it is a place where a community resolves our disputes, and we need to make it more open and accessible. And I think showing kids that is the starting point. Um, I can go more into what I'm planning on doing that and how to bill out for there, but I think I'm using too much no, time. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. What a wonderful opportunity and what a wonderful chance for those kids. Our uh, last chance, our last formal question today will be asked by Dawn. 
Hi, um, what would you want to be, um, what made you want to become a judge? And what are some parts of the legal system that you would like to see change or improve? Uh, I wanted to become a judge because I wanted to help the community deal with the disputes and problems that they face and try and do it in a humane, compassionate way, while also showing fairness and impartiality. And to further, it's consistent along the lines of my dedication to public service and trying to do what I can to help and improve our community and our fellow Washingtonians, our fellow people in King County. Um, that's the primary driving force. I love the legal issues. I love the job itself, uh, but those are that's the core reason why. Um, and for what uh, some parts of the legal system that need to be improved, you know, I think we have a lawyer, a lawyer shortage, so I want to be as supportive and helpful as I can as a judge to lawyers to promote the profession, to try and get more lawyers, particularly in public defense, in prosecution uh, offices. That way they can do better uh, uh, jobs. I mean, they're doing great, but they're stressed. Uh, and we need to address that. And we need to provide avenues um, for, for them to get some of the help that they need. So that way the system can work better. Also, as judges, you know, judges are kind of the last to make any kinds of changes on technology, on anything like that. It's one of the silver linings of the pandemic is access to platforms like this, conducting hearings over Zoom, where you can save costs to the parties for not having to travel. And I think we need to improve uh, and look into ways to better utilize those, while also recognizing times when we need to have people there, look them in the eye and, uh, you know, have that face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, and have better ways to assess what, what's right for d each circumstance. Thank you so much, Paul. Well, that ends our formal questions. Let me pause here and see if we have any follow-up from our eboard members. Otherwise, we will. I see one from Amanda. Yeah, I'm just. I'm just curious. Um, I, I, with these, uh, with these races, particularly for judges, um. We, you know, have a lot of non-lawyers and few folks not familiar with the system who are making voting decisions. And, you know, a lot of times we'll choose not to vote at all or choose just, you know, maybe uh, with less information. Do you have any thoughts or advice on how you would like to see folks that aren't, you know, that aren't lawyers, aren't familiar? How would you like to be judged, so to speak, uh, for this and for us to consider our votes? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a hard Thing to figure out. I'm sorting it out myself as I'm going through this election process now that I appear to have a contested race. Um, you know, I think it is about getting into the community and explaining what we do, explaining that we're human. Um, I, I do trust in the end the voter to read through, uh, see through what's really going on here, who's fair, who's impartial, who's doing what they picture a judge ought to do. Um, and then it's incumbent upon me and us to explain what we do and explain the issues that we face, um, uh, try and explain the law in as simple and straightforward of a fashion so that way we're not, uh, it's not arcane legalese, but it's something that's understandable to the public. Thank you. Don? Um, you mentioned that there is a shortage of um, attorneys public defenders and prosecuting attorneys, which makes um, being a judge that much more challenging because everyone is already surpassing their threshold, their capacities. What can be done to entice attorneys and law students and people from all walks of life and ages into the field of law to study law and to Seattle to practice law? Study and practice is, I think, the larger question. Yeah, you know, I've been trying to think about that. And it's hard as a judge to, you know, really step up on the advocacy for policy, right? I have ethical constraints on me that preclude me from getting into political discussions. And as a result, I have to frame my answer uh, consistent with that. Mm -hmm. um, I do think as a judge, it's on me to try and make the space a positive space and try and highlight what good work prosecutors, criminal defense lawyers largely do and why they need to be supported. And so, and the same for my fellow judges as we grapple with increased caseloads um, and, and the like. Uh, so that way, the more the public can know, the more um, the, the lawyers know that, okay, we, we see it, we're trying to, you know, we're trying to be fair and impartial while also respect 
what circumstances you're in and the effects of that, because we also have the counter effect or the counter concern of these individuals who are in jail potentially for long periods of time um, that, you know, might be found to be innocent. Uh, and so we need to make sure that their constitutional rights are protected and we uh, need to be careful with the um, friction points between the council issues and the rights uh, of the defendants, which, of course, since it's constitution are paramount. So do I hear you correct in just being more transparent about people? We need more people in the law field here. I, I think that's right, as well as just to kind of wave the banner for how awesome and, and great the legal profession actually is and can be. Um, yes, there's we have concerns within the legal profession. We need to address those and deal with those areas where we're failing our fellow lawyers. Thank you. Our last follow up today will be from Laura Marie. So thank you very much for all of your thoughts on these questions. And if if I ever had to appear in court, I would hope to have a judge as kind and compassionate and communicative as you are. And so I'm wondering how can you expand that communication to address the public's concerns or frustrations about the current state of the legal system? Uh, I, I think it's interacting with the public. It's doing hopefully stuff like what I'm doing right now. Um, you know, and that's more from my perspective as a judge. I also think uh, lawyers can do the same. I think the public by educating themselves about what the, we do um, is helpful. I also think just going back to some of the core principles of our democracy and reminding ourselves of why we have the system we have and sticking to that uh, is, is uh, if, if we're reminded of that, then we can kind of see a better lens of some of the weird things that are going on in our society and how to best address them. Thank you so much, Paul, for being with us this afternoon. This now ends the formal part of our interview.